Welcome to our Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Christopher Van Kaufman. And this is the podcast for January 14th, uh, 2024. And it is a set of parables in John 4. So we skipped ahead a chapter. Uh, Mark some four. of the other stories. Excuse me? Mark 4. What did I say, John 4? John 4. <laughs> What's wrong with me? This is Mark 4. And we, we skip um, the ending of Mark 2 and uh, Mark 3. Those uh, stories are covered in other years. And then Mark 4 is really the parable chapter in, uh, in this gospel. And in this gospel, you first of all, you get a long parable with a saying about parables and then the explanation, and then a series of short parables. Uh, so the, the first parable, uh, and obviously if this is too much, if you think this is too much, you can, uh, you can edit and, and call what you want. But the first parable is uh, uh, especially important um, in terms of Mark, and it it shows that those those who follow Jesus. Well, let me not say that it doesn't show anything. It's a story, and when I was years ago researching how stories work and trying to understand narrative, uh, the shape of the Christian narrative. One of the books I read, and I can't remember which one, uh, it was a, sec a book, a secular book, it had nothing to do with uh, Christian narrative, but it said the more story, the more work that your story requires from the listener, the more effective it will be. And this parable does uh, require work from the listener, which then the explanation starts to undermine by having an explanation to it. But so maybe we just stick with the parable itself. And uh, that this is about a farmer who uh, who is sort of not careful with where uh, he sows his seeds, plants his seeds, or just, just you know scatters them, uh, because a lot of them end up uh, in places where they can't grow uh, in a good way. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that point up uh, that these parables require work because one of the misperceptions, I guess is the word I'll use about parables is that they're simple stories, that they're illustrations that are easy to understand and that they were told to simple folk using everyday imagery. And the first thing I want to point out about that is how uh, superior that explanation is this idea that we are sophisticated modern people and that these simple folk needed simple explanations. Uh, I think I'm sensitive to this, especially having married into a farm family. The idea that country people are simple is still a one in our society. But also one of the things, and this goes back to something I said in Mark 1, is that Mark is very, is very good at guiding his readers, at helping them to think with the narrative. And one of the things he does here, and I want to point us out, is he tells us about how to read parables. And uh, it's a somewhat troubling passage. So he says this in uh, 1411. He says, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables. And then we have in Greek what we call a purpose clause. It explains what the purpose of the parables is in order that they may look but not perceive, listen and not understand, and with the results, so we have a result clause, you're getting your Greek grammar here today, with the result that they may not turn again and be forgiven. What do you make of this, Rolf? Well, I don't know what to make of it, and I've only been working on this for about 35 years. Um, Again, my beloved teacher, Don Jewell, uh, who was a Mark, Mark was his thing. And he would, uh, he would uh, put this verse out in front and watch people squirm and try to get out from under it. And one of the things he would say, well, it's a quotation from Isaiah 6. And if you look it up in Isaiah 6, hoping that the original context was going to help you, it just makes it worse <laughs> because Isaiah 6 God says to the prophet Isaiah, upon calling him, you're going to preach bad news. 
And he goes, how long do I got to do that? He goes, well, you got to do it until cities are laid to waste and uh, they're, they're not going to listen to you. Uh, and uh, especially the so that, now I have a question about your Greek grammar for you, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. So the, the so that, is that also a purpose clause? May pota? May pota means never. I think that it's a hoste. It is a result clause. So we have the okay. purpose. So purpose, of course, being you do something in order that something else happens. Yep. A result clause, something happens, and then another thing happens. So the the result of their not perceiving, they're not understanding, they're not listening, is their inability to turn and forgive. So with that as the background, uh, and Jewel interacted a lot with a, a, a secular scholar named Frank Kermode, who's art, who has an article uh, in a book called The Genesis of Secrecy about this particular challenge. But um, going back to the parable, I do think it's really important. Uh, two insights. Soil can't change itself. So the typical sermon uh, that my teacher Gerhard Ferdi used to say about this text is, choose to be good soil and support the capital campaign. <laughs> um, soil, can, soil, cannot, uh, soil cannot amend itself, but it can be amended externally. Uh, so soil can change, but it can't change itself. And in terms of evangelism, this text, I think it invites us to be wild with how we spread the word. And uh, we, we finally don't know who's going to be good soil, um, but there will be. The promise is here, there will be a harvest. And we don't really have to worry right now about the harvest because it has been promised by God. Yeah. And I think, too, that this... This parable points, and this, especially this quotation from Isaiah, points at a really important challenge that is facing the church today that we have often, especially previously when the church occupied a different cultural space, we did not wrestle as much with, which is the question of why don't some believe? And especially a difficult question when for those of us on the inside, it can seem so natural. And also, it can seem like there is only good to believing. That if there is only good from it, why wouldn't you? And Jesus, the, the explanation, which I, I see what you mean in terms of undermining, but which also explicates some of the things, talks about the fact that believing brings its own challenges. And that's one of the things that I think this parable also points out to us as preachers is not just to be indiscriminate, but also to know that in preaching, you are calling people to a challenging thing. You are not simply making their lives easier or making their lives better, but calling them to uh, this life, this life of repentance and believing in the good news. Yes. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um so, so then there's a set of uh, other shorter sayings. The first is about the lamp under a bushel. Uh, and some, a lot of these songs, uh, these uh, sayings uh, have taken shape in children's songs that some of us learned when we were children or teach other children to believe, uh, or excuse me, to sing and to recite. Um, but Jesus says, is a lamp brought in to be put under the bushel basket. Nothing, there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. What do you, what do you make of that? Well, I think that this goes to, I was thinking uh, about Mark chapter 13 when I hear this, where we get the same sort of uh, language. There is nothing said in secret that will not be shouted from the rooftops. So kind of. Uh, phrased in another way. And, and it goes back to what we see in the parable of the sower, is that it is hidden words. It is 
discourse that is mysterious and takes work, but then it works itself out and we see its results. That even though this takes place in secret, its results are plain and obvious to be seen. And I think that's one of the things that uh, even plays out in the Gospel of Mark itself, is that there is this movement where we don't know how people are going to react to Jesus until they do. And then it becomes very obvious uh, what effect he has on them. So I think that's part, part of how I would begin to think about what it means that nothing is secret that will not be disclosed or will not come to light. The next parable is simply a parable of growth, that uh, it's saying that the kingdom grows around us even while we're sleeping. The earth produces first the stock and so on. And then when it's time for harvest, you go in and harvest. Uh, followed by the parable of the mustard seed, which, uh, which is the last in our series or in our text for this week. And that is that the mustard seed, uh, though it is a very small seed, and by you know by the way, when it says it, the smallest of all the seeds on earth, this is not to be taken uh, overly literally, but it's a very tiny seed, and out of it can grow a, a, a huge, uh, really huge plant. Uh, so, how big would these uh, mustard? shrubs or uh i don't know if technically what kind of plant they are yeah i mean uh, we would call them a shrub they're all so there are interestingly enough if you drive on say highway five in california which is the highway that goes up and uh, north south from los angeles to san francisco uh mustards from the middle east are highly invasive in california so you can see them all over the place and they're big i mean they're shrubs they're probably six feet tall or something like that with a pretty wide spread and so i mean i, I love this because it is and yet when it's sown it grows up and becomes the greatest of all the shrubs right so the, you know there's this in this passage this sort of playfulness in this parable in terms of not the greatest of all the trees of course, but the greatest of all the shrubs. And uh, one of the things that I think this interacts with is that there's a lot in the Old Testament in terms of the tree as a symbol. We see this in Daniel. Um, I believe that we see it also, is it in Ezekiel? The tree as a symbol of uh, empire or as a symbol of kingdoms. Uh, you can think of, for example, the cedars of Lebanon. And so there's a little bit of a wink in this parable, I think, in terms of what grows up is not a great tree, but a great shrub. Uh, and it's it gives uh, the birds of the air a place to nest. Well, that's the fun thing, right? Because uh, according to my notes, uh, six feet was a normal, but they can be as high as 30. I mean, uh, these things in the Holy Land can get immense. And... Because remember, this is about the kingdom. What is the kingdom of God like? And then there is even a call to the Psalms here, um, not to the not to the Psalm one with the tree, but rather to the Psalm where it says that in the temple, uh, even the birds of the air can make their nest there. And so uh, there's there's a, a nod and a wink saying the kingdom of God, the people, is the new temple, the place where God's present where the people meet God and even the birds of the air are welcome. <laughs>